Hey everyone, Michael Adams here with Andrew Paskin. How's it going, Andy? I'm great, mate. How are you? I'm good. So uh, you're all about to hear the first part of Chapter 27 of the Super League War. Before we get to that, uh, we've got a, a couple of things to discuss. Firstly is to issue an erratum or a, a clarification about some of the, the legal proceedings we discussed in our prior chapter. Shout out to Kyle Katazi and a few other blokes that, that wrote in. I've got a few shout outs of my own. So basically this concerns the query we posited about the fact that Ken Cowley's failure to appear as a witness was held against him by Bachet. We both expressed amusement as to whether this was legal and whether this was valid. Uh, in my defense, only one of us has a law degree, Andrew. <laughs> I feel like a, uh, a league player in a league club car park reading an apology note, like I'm disappointed, you know, let the, let the boys down, let UTS <laughs> down. But I will say this, it may be a key tenet of civil procedure, but I did like learn that by rote the morning of the exam and got a credit and then never thought of it again. So I'll, I'll give myself <laughs> a pass on that. <laughs> it's so embarrassing. Let's explain it then. So I, I received a number of emails, tweets, the rest of it. The first one I got was from Joshua Carton, who sent me a great explanation about a Jones and Dunkel finding. Uh, And what he said was that basically, yes, in a criminal procedure, it can't be held against you that if you don't appear. But with civil proceedings, if you have evidence, if you clearly have evidence, but don't appear, then that is something that can be weighed into the argument. So in this case, Ken Cowley clearly had some evidence that would have been of interest to the case. The fact that News Limited failed to call him as a witness can be used to indicate that maybe that evidence wouldn't have been in News Limited's favour. Yeah, 100%. I was thinking in the criminal terms as I always am. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, so thanks to Josh for that. I've also got to thank Jeffrey Gabriel, a long-term friend and correspondent of the show. My own personal legal counsel, David King, also got in touch about that. Uh, He also is demanding we issue a correction about or a retraction of our comments about Jonathan Thurston when we spoke about him in our Immortals episode. Uh, He hounds me every week about that, but I'm going to leave him hanging on that one. Well, yeah, I'm going to shout out Kyle Katazi, longtime uh, antagonist and friend of the show, and Josh Brandon, great bloke, done a lot for the show as well behind the scenes for writing to me and, you know, politely saying you're a moron. And <laughs> uh, out of all the most embarrassing things I've said on this podcast, Russell Crowe, Sean McRae, to, to name but a few, this is the most mortifying. <laughs> uh, but anyway, thank you all for that. I think when we um, posted the first part of our 100 nil chapter, Andrew Chapman, I believe, is the name. He said, I love a podcast that recommends a 60,000 word court judgment as light reading. <laughs> I love the fact that we will say something and get, you know, six or seven legal experts writing us in with what we got wrong. So I think that says something about the caliber of our listeners, uh, and we're very grateful to you all. What about the fact that I didn't even go back to read the summary of Jones and Dunkel after being uh, (laughs) pulled up on it? So that's how lazy I am. But onwards and upwards. It's a learning experience, mate, so we'll move on from that. And it's really disappointing. It's not something you like to do. Uh... <laughs> the other thing I wanted to discuss today before we get to the episode proper is that we have set up a Rugby League Digest Patreon. So uh, over the last few years, there's been a lot of really kind messages about ways that people might be able to support us. This is one way we'd be really grateful to anyone who does want to sign up. We'll have some bonus content, some special episodes. I've already put up the first three of our history corners from the previous incarnation of the show. So uh, as a Patreon subscriber, you will get access to all of those old history corners. Um, You know, I'm putting up a few every week. There's going to be interviews with some comedians about rugby league, Michael, and some, you know, rugby league identities and academics and stuff like that. So it's going to be some, you know, bonus content and we may even get the video going. Uh, you can see our uh, rude heads uh, live if you want to do that as well. But We're trying to attract subscribers, Andrew. <laughs> we'll have a poll to see if that's an a yay or a nay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it's very early days for this. So we are still working it all out. So there'll be more news as we go along. I want to say the best thing any of you can do for this show is to listen to it. So as long as you're doing that, we're eternally grateful to you. If you love the show and don't have the means or inclination to support us financially, 
the next best thing you can do is to spread the word. So, of course, give us a review on Apple Podcasts, but more importantly, tell a friend. Now, Michael, one of the points we discussed about this whole uh, Patreon business is the Super League War, the Jewel in the Crown, the origin series of the podcast will always remain free. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So our chapters and our case studies will always be free. So they'll be part of the main Rugby League Digest feed, uh, but we'll just be doing some extra things on Patreon. So you can look forward to all of that. We'll have more news as we go along. But I don't want to harp on about it too much today. So how about we just get into the show? There it is. It was Friday, February 23, 1996, and Justice Pachet handed down his decision in favour of the ARL. As Super League aligned players in Fiji for the World Nines were briefed by Ken Cowley on what would come next. Across Australia and New Zealand, the ramifications of the decision filtered through to the rest of the players and clubs. What seemed like a terminal blow for the Rebels brought only defiance, as players everywhere affirmed their unwavering support for Super League. As events unfolded over the next few weeks, the 1996 ARL season was in serious jeopardy. This is part one of Together Again, the 27th chapter in the Rugby League Digest's in-depth investigation of the Super League War. Welcome back to the Rugby League Digest. I'm Michael Adams, here with Andrew Paskin. How's it going, Andy? Mate, fantastic. How are you? I'm really nervous about this one. Why is that? Well, you know, long-time listeners will know that we try to segment this story into chapters that are broken down thematically. It might be a certain team, a certain event, uh, you know, whatever the breakdown might be. I think we've done a pretty good job of that today, but I'm very worried this, which is the first of a three-part chapter i'm worried this whole chapter is just three hours of footballers saying obnoxious things (laughs) and to be fair you could probably characterize most of the show that way anyway (laughs) but so the players are the focus of this chapter anyone who listened to our previous chapter which dealt with the bachet judgment and the subsequent orders coming down against super league we're retreading some of the same ground but from the perspective of the players so how they felt with the decision and what their next steps were. So I'm assuming it's got some deep and nuanced thought to it. (laughs) Well, a lot of it. So let's get straight into it. So we start our story in Suva, the World Nines, which we've talked about. That was the place where Super League was launched worldwide and was the place where a couple of days later, the hammer came down and the players over there for the Nines found out that Super League going ahead was looking a shaky prospect. It would really suck to be in Fiji for that. Like, you're away from everything. The facilities aren't that great. Communication isn't that great. (laughs) Well, you might say that, but like, I'm quite surprised by some of the technological stuff that they were able to achieve. So we'll go to the conference room of the Trade Winds Resort in Suva, where the players gathered. As you'll know, the second day of the tournament had been called off. So the players went to see Heat and had just come back from seeing Heat when the decision was about to come down. Yeah, Nico. That's pretty good. First run, big budget movie. On at the same time, they get back to the hotel, wait for the decision, which they had a live feed going. Laurie Daly said, We must have cut a strange sight for any outsider looking in. We could have been waiting for a Melbourne Cup result or the score from the grand final, but a federal court judge? (laughs) I don't know if a bunch of players sitting in a room waiting to hear a Melbourne Cup result would have looked any less strange. (laughs) I don't know what he's trying to say. We used to mock Laurie for being such a dopey Dora and boring and everything, but he's actually a character. Oh, I mean, he's always been a character. I think there's a lot of Laurie Daly talk in the first two parts of this chapter. I'll, I'll set that up right now. But his character changed over the course of his career and his, you know, post playing career. So the young Loz, which I think is most people's favorite Loz. Yeah. Uh, you know, didn't mind a drink, you know, was... Well, I actually love the current Laws as well. But... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, like latter-day Laws, you know, uh, the kind of elder statesman of the game and everything since is just like everyone loves Laurie Daly. You just give me an idea, the church of latter-day Lozers. <laughs> <laughs> but it is in this period in particular where that public perception really took a hit. We're going to talk about that a whole lot more uh, over the course of this chapter. But so the play, Laurie and the rest of the players were gathered in the conference room 
to hear the verdict, which obviously didn't come down in their favour. They were then told, so the senior Super League people there uh, for the Australian and New Zealand teams were uh, Trevor McEwen for New Zealand and Michael O'Connor, the Australian manager. Morris Lindsay was also there as well. wonder how Snows reacted. (laughs) So that senior management there advised the players to hold on because they were going to wait to get across from Ken Cowley and get word about what the next steps were going to be. Uh, And so when that happened, Ken Cowley basically instantly said that it's not over. We're appealing. You know, as far as you have to worry about its business as usual, we're gearing up to start the season next week. So don't worry about it. If I was a player and I saw that flogging in the first case and they're going, don't worry about it, we're appealing, I'd be panicking my ass off. I think the players were very trusting of the word they're receiving from News Limited. So Ken Cowley's strong words basically emboldened them to A, not worry about it and just assume it was all going ahead and to B, kind of double down in the press and really go all in on the Super League dream. I suppose it's not that hard to convince a league player. (laughs) If someone tells you it's sweet, yeah, it's yeah, sweet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, and that was basically Ricky Stewart's exact quote. So he said, going from what we've been told, everything is on track and we'll be starting next <laughs> Friday night. <laughs> okay. Which I know I made the point that they trusted News Limited and, you know, they were operating under that advice. But to have heard the judgment come down so strongly against Super again to go, oh, it seems like it's all on track. <laughs> But also with that united front that the players put up and the, you know, the kind of echoing the, the Super League talking points, you're starting to get a sense of some of the trouble that would lie ahead. So Laurie Daly's comment on it was, there's no way in the world that we want to go back to the ARL. And I think a lot of players do feel like that. Right from the start, I've said, I don't want to play in the ARL. Now, if I go back and play, I'll be going against my own word and everything I stand for. Now, reputations were attacked throughout this whole war, right? But looking back on it in the hindsight of 20, 30 years, all I think about now is guys like that and guys like Talis. I don't want to get ahead of us in the chapters, but Talis sitting out the season, you look back on that and go, that's integrity. That's a man's man. And they were getting attacked for being having no integrity, but really they, they showed it. Yeah, and there's a lot of they were damned if they do and damned if they don't. And we'll see how that played out over the next couple of weeks in 1996. Well, I just think it's a very Weasley thing if you decide to jump ship like that and then go, oh, it's not going our way, we're going to jump back. Well, well, hold on to that for part two of this chapter because I think you can make an argument for some Weaseling on the part of the players. (laughs) But we'll save that for next week. Uh, And let's stay in Suva. And the initial response of the players was to send a fax, uh, a united statement about their future and what they thought would happen with Super League. Uh, So the Australians sent a fax and so did the New Zealanders. I'll just read from that Australian uh, statement. We are all very disappointed about yesterday's event. However, we regard it as a temporary setback. We wish to register to you our unwavering and categorical support for Super League. We remain as committed to the concept of Super League as we did the day we signed. In fact, we are now more committed than ever. None of us have any desire to play rugby league under the banner of the ARL. So strong words there echoed by the New Zealand media release, and that filtered back through to the rest of the Super League players in Australia. So you had uh, the Western Reds taking out ad space in the the West Australian. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Any other ways to incinerate money? or (laughs) Don't worry about the ad. Uh, So they said, we will not play under the ARL banner in any circumstances. Um, Well, you have to wonder how many people reading the West Australian actually knew what the ARL banner was. They they couldn't do that through a journalist? (laughs) They're going to buy an ad. Well, that's funny. I didn't think about it. But yeah, I'm, I'm sure there would have been a journalist who could have quite happily... So the question is, would you play under the ARL? And they go, no, we won't. That's it. Uh, the Bulldogs also putting out a combined statement saying, we do not wish to play in any competition run or administered by the Australian Rugby League. In our minds, there is only one competition we're interested in playing in, that being the Super League run competition. The Warriors statement, interestingly, like echoed some of the ARL slogan so it was super league must run the game (laughs) do you reckon it was run past db (laughs) so that was where the players were at that point in the immediate aftermath of the decision so it was very very strongly worded statements and a a united front saying 
you know, we're committed to Super League. The clubs were in a more difficult position in terms of how they were going to proceed. So it's at this point you start getting the players training with their shirts inside out and all that sort of stuff. And On the subject of shirts inside out, in Newcastle in the, in the mid to late 90s, there was a thing called the World's Biggest Disco. I think trading on the Fatty Vaught and World's Biggest Barbie uh, phenomenon. So you paid $2 to get into the world's biggest disco at the Newcastle Workers Club upstairs. The bouncers were the biggest dickheads known to man and they wouldn't let you in if you had like a surf brand or something or a branded shirt. And they're not in that shirt made ocean and earth, whatever, of quicksilver. Like, and then they say, well, what am I going to do? I'm out with my family. And they say, well, you can turn it inside out and come in. And the guys would literally take their shirts off in the foyer, turn it inside out, and they were allowed to go to the world's biggest disco. <laughs> we'll have to ask Ben Darwin if he was ever there taking off his <laughs> Newcastle Uni rugby union polo, turning it inside out for entry. So you can't have logos soiling your club, but you can have inside out shirts. And more to the point, a bunch of like blokes standing on the street <laughs> getting undressed. So back to the Rams and Mariners, they were in a very weird position because they had to kind of follow the party line of saying, yeah, we're going ahead. Great decision in court the other day, so <laughs> Friday night should be good. But it was, you know, death if it didn't go their way, which it didn't look like it was. So how would you be if you were in the Mariners front office going like, all right, we've got the death threats, we've got no fans, people hate our guts. Oh, now we haven't got a comp. <laughs> this is the best job ever. And when you consider like half the night's front office like jump ship yeah. to yeah. join the Mariners, like how would you be feeling? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But the statement from the Rams, for instance, their PR manager, Rick Keegan, I've got a feeling that a lot of these press releases were coming from further up the chain at News Limited because they bear a strong resemblance to one another. So the Rams said, it's business as usual at the Rams. The players are training for the first match. The response from the players has been fantastic. They're 100% committed to Super League. So this is the point we were at in the immediate aftermath of the judgment, where it didn't look like Super League could go ahead, but the hammer hadn't officially come down. So Super League clubs were still talking about playing trials. The players were still talking about not playing for the ARL. And we can see that these troubles are going to go on over the next few weeks. But we've got to talk about the ARL's response. You saw in our last chapter, the ARL were very conciliatory towards you know the Super League administration and clubs and trying to come towards an agreement where, look, we won the court case, so... And this is what it is for now. So let's just focus on getting the game back together. More by necessity, really. I mean, obviously, it was in their best interest to have all the clubs and all the players there and Super League buried for the time being, at least. But they made it very clear that there wouldn't be any recriminations against clubs or players. Statements like this from Quayle set the tone. It was agreed that there was no animosity towards the eight rebel clubs. The most important thing will be getting them back on the field. This filtered down to the players with Brad Fittler, offering his Australian captaincy back to Laurie Daly. Well, that was beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. I mean, I don't think he was in a position to actually go through with it, but it shows that the players just wanted the game back together. Yeah, but also it's like the respect for Loz. Yeah, yeah, true. And I mean, all through this, the A-roll players especially were just like, you know, the Super League players are still our mates. This isn't really between us. It's just, it's a fight beyond our level. The Super League players did kind of, or some of them at least, kind of start to, you know, hang on to those News Limited talking points. You know, Glenn Lazarus later in the year saying that he didn't know if he'd be welcomed into the country dressing room if he got selected because the ARL players would be mad at him. <laughs> if it's affecting country origin, <laughs> it's time to, time to hang it up. But the, when I say the ARL were conciliatory, and I think they were genuine in not wanting recrimination and just wanting the show to go on. But it was always only to a point. Like, there was always a carrot and stick. So comments like this from Arthurson uh, when he was asked if he was worried about players sitting out. I'm absolutely certain they wouldn't. After all, the fans of the game, and that would very much be a slight to the fans of the game of rugby league. So always this, like, subtle pressure being applied and, you know, kind of twisting it a bit in the ARL's favour. Like, a lot of this Arco's public statements are just his natural cunning, like, coming to the fore. I know it's one of your favourite fatty stories of him, like, going into Arco's office, like, and Arco talking about the contract he was going to offer. Fatty Vorton, like, walking out of the office going, oh, how good have I done? And then halfway home realised that he'd been stitched up by Arco again. But Arco always applying the pressure subtly, John Quayle, you know, using a bludgeon to apply it. 
So he came out and said about Super League players making alternative plans. I hope they have luck with the javelin or whatever and qualify for Atlanta. If they miss out, they're still wel- welcome in our team. <laughs> well, surely qualifications were done by then for the Olympics. <laughs> but so throughout late February, after the judgment was handed down, into mid-March, the ARL were perpetually in this cycle of like welcoming and pressuring. So it was always no recriminations, but you'll be held in contempt if you don't play. You know, it was always just this kind of like tension between the two, you know, talking about clubs being permanently kicked out. Uh, Quail said that they had a rival Cairns team set up to take the Cowboys place. They could also start a second Brisbane team because the first time they tried to set up a second Brisbane team went so well. So why not jump back in a year later? A potential Wellington team. So these statements were coming out to kind of say, You guys aren't replaceable, so it's time to come and join us or we'll make other plans. That's a good point there. The Wellington team just brought back memories. Remember when that was like a monthly trope? Mm -hmm. Wellingtons were like, what year did that just die out? I don't think it's completely died out, but I think now they're definitely like, you know, the third or fourth in the pecking order. But so back to the players. And I mentioned that the signs were there early on. And this went all the way back to before the outcome of the court case. You had, you know, someone like Brad Clyde saying, in January 1996, in preference to playing under the ARL, we would rather sit out. So that was being telegraphed from very early on that, you know, the judgment wouldn't necessarily be the end of it. Is that from up top, you think, or is that off their own bat? I think it's a case of the players being easily led the, mm-hmm. and the players being sold a vision that was definitely better in their favour. All the conditions, everything else that went along with it, they were being told that they were going to be, you know, on bedroom walls next to Michael Jordan across the world, you know? And I think it's kind of easy to believe that when you're, you know, like a supreme athlete, you know, playing the greatest game of all. Like, I think they believed in the vision to a point. I would love to see like a kid's bedroom with uh, Michael Jordan and Simon Gillies. (laughs) (laughs) Darren Britt. So I think it was a mix of being fed some lines. I'm quite certain that there was some media training and there were talking points that they had to stick to. Well, this was the start of the end of the personality of the rugby yeah, league yeah, player. Yeah. The media training started with Super yeah. League. Awful. So, yeah. So, I think it was a mix of genuine and some training or some guidance from above. But it wasn't just the players. It was administrators, coaches, all the rest of it. And I think this quote from Tim Sheens really sets up the, you know, the mood at the time. So, this was in a uh, Sydney Morning Herald article by Roy Masters. You talk to my players. Super League wasn't put on by a couple of chief execs. It's the players themselves. I was in a meeting with all the players when they were talking about amalgamation between Super League and the ARL. They don't want anything to do with it unless it's on their terms. There's deep resentment there, more so than the ARL have any idea. I believe that to an extent. I mean, they were treated like afterthoughts and pawns a lot of the time. Yeah. And I mean, we've heard tough quotes from Sheens before. It's clear the resentment felt by Sheens was like deep set. Yeah. And was going all the way back to being at Penrith in the late 70s. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah. So I think there was like an element of like, we're going to get these bastards now, you know. And I think it's actually a stronger feeling among like the coaches and administrators than the players. Like the players, I think in general, they'll follow the money, they'll follow their mates. I think this was out of character, all these strong statements and like these defiant stances. But so at this time, the players had to really brush up on a lot of things, uh, including the law. And in very quick time, we saw them becoming absolute legal experts. <laughs> so uh, I think I, I just want to start this portion of the episode uh, with a quote from Roy Masters that was uh, published on the 2nd of March, 1996. Ask a Super League what he thinks Bachet's qualifications are for making such rulings, and the reply would probably be, how many tests did he play for Australia? <laughs> so that was on the 2nd of March. One of our very good friends, Matthew Ridge, uh, in Rugby League Week on the 6th of March, uh, said this, With all due respect to his honour, he's been trying to get his head around this for about a year, but the game has been played for 100 years. I've been involved for seven years, and the things I've seen, he certainly can't have seen. <laughs> As far as I'm concerned, he can't tell me where I can or can't play. <laughs> when you start a sentence with all respect to his honour, you know something good's coming. 
<laughs> the best part there is breaking it down into the years. He's played it for seven, so he knows more than this federal court judge. <laughs> That there is the microcosm of like when people say why are Billy players like that? Why don't they learn? Why don't they stop mucking up and that sort of thing? That's it right there. Just this outrageous sense of entitlement and arrogance. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, uh, I present Exhibit B. This is also a Ridge quote. This was um, also in the Rugby League Week, but one issue earlier. How can a judge tell me who I can and can't play for? I, for one, have no intention of going back and playing under the ARL banner because I know what they're like. I think the judge has got the good guys mixed up with the bad guys. <laughs> In their defense, they were right. They got overturned on yeah, appeal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that it, it is this entitlement. And I can understand like being told something and it just not making sense. So this comment from Chris Anderson, I don't believe a judge should be able to tell me where I can sell my wares. If I want to coach rugby league around the world, I think I should have the freedom and right to choose that. I think it's an utter disgrace if he's telling me I can't go and get a job somewhere. I've never even met the bloke, and he's telling me where I can and can't work. <laughs> That's almost a spilt blood Yeah, crime. yeah. I mean, it's ridiculous, but I can see Chris Anderson or Matthew Ridge going like, wait, how can he tell me where I can play? And also in that, um, that Roy Masters article um, that I started this segment with, he talked about something that I thought was so brilliant that like really kind of maybe partly explains this mentality. And he's talking about in the old days of the ARL judiciary, where in his words, uh, it was Dick Dunn, who was the judiciary chairman, and the hearing would go, a player would appear and, and Dick Dunn would say, well, did you fucking well hit him or not? But, <laughs> <laughs> like that was about the extent of it. <laughs> but then he goes on to say, even when eminent QC such as Dick Conti and Alan Sullivan were appointed chairman of the judiciary and applied courtroom principles to the disciplinary hearings, players still felt free to criticise them in the media. Canterbury coach Chris Anderson once savaged Conti. Manly coach Bob Fulton stormed out of a hearing and Brisbane players have made lurid comments about prejudicial decisions for two years. No wonder players and coaches equate the law of the land with the law of the game. Like I see, think there's something to that, that they've started to become used to these, you know, this kind of like legal kind of procedure. Right, right. Uh, and they're so in their own world. Yeah, that, that's the thing. Like they're in their own world at all times. Yeah. So this defiant stance was telegraphed early on and it kept going. Uh, and part two, we're going to see how that all played out. But, you know, at this point, Steve Mascord in the Herald reported in early March that Super League players were scheduling a mini Olympics for a month's time. <laughs> Which I wish we got to see that mini Olympics. That would have been Mickey Mouse. <laughs> that would have been Michael Mouse. Well, we had the, the Rexona, Australia's Greatest Sportsman event a few years ago, you know, but I, I think more of that. You know, you want your hybrid games. I want rugby league <laughs> players staging mini Olympics. You know what sport I reckon they'd be good at? Discus. Shot put discus, just like power sports. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, shot put I, I can see. It's like, um, yeah, just brute force sports. Yeah. <laughs> Fencing, maybe not. But so at this point, with the players on the warpath, they needed, well, they, didn't, they maybe didn't need a spokesman, but they sure got one in uh, Laurie Daly. So I think the title of this column that appeared in the Sun Herald by Danny Widler kind of sets the scene. It was an interview with Laurie Daly titled, Why I Will Never Play in the ARL Again. And so Laurie Daly at this point was very strong out in the press, you know, coming out with regular statements saying that he was done with the ARL. Uh, he was going to go play AFL, as we're going to talk about a bit later. And Jesus. and so Laurie Daly was cl clearly quite aggrieved and in the same boat as Ridge and Anderson of not really understanding how it could have broken this way and how he could suddenly, like, not be able to play football for Super League. Whatever you want to say about that and some of the comments he was making, something like this a response from John Quayle, I don't think does anything to help the situation. Uh, this is another mascot column. He said, It's not surprising that Laurie Daly's saying this because he's being paid $420,000 a year by News Limited and doesn't have to play one game of football. The future's not Laurie Daly. It's every young player who wants the same opportunity Laurie Daly once got. And you could say there's validity in the statement if you want, but it's so reductive by Quayle to just turn it into a money thing. And maybe it's good PR, to, you know, just cast Daly and the other players as just money grubbing. I'm surprised that wasn't more of that. Like, there was a bit of it as it was, but especially with Quay, I'm surprised it wasn't, like, 100% vitriolic yeah. statements every day. <laughs> but that seems to be something that 
statements like that, you could tell, would have really got to Laurie Daly personally. Oh, yeah. There's a, a story that he tells in his book about comments that Ricky Stewart... So Ricky Stewart basically... At the time of the initial signings in April where Stuart hadn't made his mind up and was hearing from both sides, the ARL and Super League, uh, according to Laurie Daly, this was in that same Widler column, actually. He said, when they were talking with Ricky, trying to get him back, they told him if everything gets back anyhow, we don't want Daly back, which there's no way the ARL said that. <laughs> like, there's no way that, you know, Ken Arthurson sat down with Ricky Stewart and said, yeah, mate, like we're going to pay you a million dollars a year. You'll get the Australian captaincy. We promised to seven other blokes, but believe <laughs> us, you've got it. Um, Daly, nah, don't want him. Yeah, your best mate and uh, halves partner. Uh, probably best player in the world at this point. Don't want him. <laughs> don't want him. Like, there's no way that happened, right? But I 1,000% believe that Laurie Daly believed that it happened. Yeah, yeah. Do you reckon Sticky made that up? I think it's crossed wires. Or did it go like, um, what about Laurie then? Well, no, it's your captaincy. It's not Laurie. Like, Laurie's not here or something like that. There might have been something like that yeah. that Ricky misheard and then told his misheard version to Laurie Daly, who then misheard what Ricky Stewart said. And then. I'm going to go out on a limb and say he's got onto Sheenzy and Sheenzy's put it through, yeah, his, yeah. Put, put it through his filter. Because <laughs> you had other statements like Quail later. You know, after Stuart signed with Super League, came out publicly and said, oh, the problem was we should have gone after Laurie Daly. He wasn't as money hungry as Ricky Stewart. Which, again, just a dumb statement to make yeah, in the yeah, midst of all yeah. this. But well, and all these statements about money, it's like these guys have been like siphoning gravy off the gravy train for 40 years. But you got to say, PR-wise, that strategy totally oh, worked. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't be getting cheers at the um, Aussies for the ARL. <laughs> <laughs> and I think some of Daly's like discontent kind of started before Super League. Like you heard right in the early days of our saga, we mentioned the fact that he was really upset about missing out on the Canberra captaincy, even though he was the New South Wales captain and was, you know, pre-Super League was going to take over from Mal as Australian captain. Uh, they gave the Canberra captaincy to Ricky Stewart and Daly was out in the press talking about leaving Canberra as a result of it. So I think beyond Super League, he was also at this place in his life and his career where he just wanted respect, I think, and all this like really got to him. Well, he certainly earned it on the field. Yeah. But, I mean, at the time I remember thinking, of course you give it to Stuart. He's a half pet, blah, blah, blah. He's running the team. But looking back on it now, it should have been Laurie. The only thing about that is the refs thing because Stuart was such a, like, niggly kind of, like, he would be in the refs' faces, <laughs> like, all game. Yeah. I guess if you've got that bloke in your team and he's an influential bloke, maybe you want him as your captain right, to, right. you know be able to assert that influence. <laughs> and it came out from another uh, Canberra insider that Laurie was really pissed off about how the Australian captaincy ended up. So the insider said, Laurie doesn't trust the ARL much, not since Ken Arthurson promised him the Australian captaincy and then went back on his word. It's like, you signed with a rival organisation. <laughs> like, how did you expect that would play out? It's insane. And so in his book, Laurie said that like he wasn't one to make outlandish comments. He didn't want to always be front and centre in the press, but he felt it was incumbent on him as a senior player, you know, one of the biggest players in the game and one of Super League's key signings to kind of take on that role, you know, which is admirable, but also when you're just like inflaming the situation anytime you open your mouth, <laughs> it, it's maybe not helpful. It's a bit of a uh, damn if you do. Yeah, yeah. But just to segue away from Daly and to the rest of the players. This Daly quote kind of sums up where the players were with News Limited. When they asked him if he'd go back and play with the ARL, he said, the only way I'd do that is if News tells me to. I'm an employee of News, so I'll do what they tell me. So it was definitely like a close relationship and a player coach media release from Canberra said, in Rupert Murdoch and Ken Cowley, we have two men beside us we trust with our lives. <laughs> like we talk about like... Arco's naivety in trusting Kerry Packer. <laughs> trusting Rupert Murdoch with your life? I'd be ringing up white lady funerals <laughs> and making a booking. <laughs> Holy shit. But that, it wasn't just Daly, it wasn't just Canberra. It was like across the board, like a lot of talking points that sounded like News Limited talking points. When you have Simon Gillies saying, it's been quite obvious that the league has kept Brisbane and Canberra at arm's length. 
Those two clubs have obviously been the dominant forces in the competition throughout the 90s, yet they've had to fight tooth and nail all the way with the league. Like, do you think in like 1992, Simon Gillies was there at Canberra training going like, geez, Canberra would Brisbane get a raw deal? You know, <laughs> They are easily led, right? <laughs> But also, uh, they've been dominating the comp because one had the entire Origins team <laughs> in the whole state and the other one had $10 million in salary cap breaches. <laughs> Made them quite dominant. But on Brisbane, there was probably no stronger News Limited spokesman than Chris Johns at Brisbane. John Sattler said he watched him on TV and said, he was carrying on like a cockatoo on a perch, not letting anyone interrupt him because he was scared he'd forget his lines if he stopped talking. <laughs> and he came out with some really strong statements including a knock on Ian Heads at Norm Tasker on the, at the Rugby League Week, saying that they'd been with the a- ARL for a long time, so what do you expect with some of the stuff they would say? So Tasker and Heads like took that to heart and came back firing, like both basically saying, well, we've been with the game for a long time, but you know we play a straight bat. Ian Heads went to list you know some of his grievances with the situation like from both sides. Tasker coming out and saying like, Rugby League Week's editorial policy to play it down the line. We're not favouring any one competition, and that's how it's going to be. Well, you and I have been so lucky to meet Ian Heads and him help you, especially with your research, and just a true gentleman. We love the guy, uh, my former neighbour. But I've got to say... Yes, he's got integrity. Yes, he plays with a straight bat, but I reckon deep down he was an ARL man. <laughs> oh, he wasn't even deep down. Like He was clearly an ARL man. He'll, he'll tell you that, and I think Tusker is the same. But you can see it in all, the, all of their columns throughout this period. They were giving it to whoever they felt needed it. Well, remember like um, people, us included, thought it was a Super League bias in the time. So yeah. the bias yeah. was, uh, was so slim that it could go either way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Head said... Tasker and I have worn flack now and then from both sides along the way in telling of this convoluted saga. In fact, as I write these few words, I'm awaiting a response from Phillip Street on a story I wrote for Rugby League Week last week, The Game Soul is Bleeding. I'm told that it was not well regarded. He listed his grievances as being, one, the way News Limited went about it was sneaky and, you know, not good for the game. Two, but the ARL is in no way whatsoever a pristine or blameless organisation. But that, disregarding one and two, the great enduring tragedy in the whole thing lies in the failure of two supposedly intelligent organisations to find common ground that would have benefited the one thing that so desperately and increasingly needed help, the game of rugby league. And I think that is basically where Heads and Tusker come down, is they have sympathies to the ARL, but... You know, it's the game. Well, you and I both read the magazine at that time. You've reread them all word for word. There's no bias in them. No, no. It's a proper journalist perspective. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but Chris Johns is someone I want to talk about more because I remember being like amazed at times, like, wow, he's play Origin now, he's running Super League, and, you know, he must be a real smart guy and everything. Is he the key link between the players getting brainwashed? He's like just out of playing. He's with Rebo. Well, he was still playing. It was his last year as a player. Is that right? Yeah. I thought it was way earlier. Uh, he was doing uh, double duties, so uh, playing for the Broncos at centre and also serving as assistant Brisbane CEO. <laughs> That's the ultimate captain coach. <laughs> I had no idea he was still playing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God. Yeah. I mean, I want to push back on the idea of brainwashing. I think like that's a bit strong. Like, yeah, that's a hyperbole. But yeah, I mean, yeah. it, like, it, it just seems like the talking points they're getting – They'd have to be told by a player that they were fair nickum. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and the thing about Johns is he was a players association type guy. He was, you know, a senior player, well respected across the game. He was a good speaker. You know, the fact that like I mean, it might be jobs for the boys that he got the assistant CEO role at the Broncos. <laughs> he was Qantas apprentice of the year twice in a row, so but you know, he went on to achieve good things at Melbourne, like he definitely had the qualities. That's amazing that he's still uh, he's still trying to work out defensive patterns in the back line and he's <laughs> <laughs> acting CEO. <yeah. laughs> but the way he spoke at the time was like someone who had double the dose of Kool-Aid as John Rebo. <laughs> like he went in like full on. That's what I mean. I remember it so well. Yeah. It was right behind it. And like came out with some really strong statements. So when there was talk that the ARL players had formed their own players association, Johns came out and said, I'm pessimistic that the committee doesn't have any real guts. I don't think John Quayle has changed his ways. He's still wielding his big stick to beat us with. First he says he'll talk and consult with us, but then he turns around and says Super League players were overpaid and that the salary cap should return. 
when I read that, I wonder like how much of a problem he had with Quail before Super League. Like I feel like Quail has just been like his face put on the dartboard at all Super League clubs, and you know it's like Quail's the big bad. We got to get Quail. You know, well he would have had Brisbane Broncos bile any yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. So there's but, definitely some of but that. But he was playing for the Blues. I yeah. mean, so. So I don't know where I stand on that. I think there would have been some like antipathy before Super League, but it just seems too easy. Like maybe the players needed a key villain. Oh, it was just too easy to course. put it on Quail. But like Quail says, he's the one delivering bad news. Yeah, yeah. Probably with a smile on his face. John's went a bit far when he likened playing for the ARL as a return to slavery. <laughs> That comment today, imagine what that would get you oh, today. Even at the time, it wouldn't get the kind of like political blowback. Like how would like the Aussies for the ARL react to, <laughs> to hearing something like that, you know? How would Rex Mossop react to hearing something like that? <laughs> oh, that's too funny. But at the same time, like he's a football player whose, you know, foot resides in his mouth. That's just, that's the way it goes with him. But he was like delivering some really good argument. So I'm, I'm just going to read it a couple of days in a row. So he said, you want to know why most of the players are dirty on the ARL? Because the ARL is fostering mediocrity. That's why. Their competition is no longer a competition for elite players because there are way too many teams. Everyone knows that, but the ARL don't have the guts to make the tough decisions. Yep. Fair point. And they asked to consider the fans, but did they consider the fans last year when the likes of Laurie Daly, Steve Renoff and Andrew Weddinghausen were left out of rep football? Fair point. <laughs> <laughs> Any coach or player who's critical of the establishment is fined ten thousand dollars. But really, that's been the only avenue for them to have a voice. A couple of years ago, when we were playing preseason games in January at two thirty p.m., and all the players were forced to cool down under big fans on the sideline, I can recall doctors saying how dangerous it was. Tim Sheens complained to the ARL about the welfare of his players, but he was ignored, told to stop his whinging. Fair point. <laughs> And, you know, he goes on to mention he played at that Melbourne Origin game in 1994, you know, in front of 87,000 people. His match fee for that, $3,000. The Queensland players got $1,500. No wonder the Queenslanders hate him. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, that's just such short-sighted administration. Yeah. You got that much revenue from the event and then the players putting their body literally on the line. Yeah. You go, all right, he's, he's a few bucks. Oh, they did fly Mal's family to England, <laughs> uh, you know, on the kangaroo tour, so we'll call it even. Yeah. Well, he's making really good points, but you shouldn't get a medal for that because it's quite obvious as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's interesting that a lot of people, coaches, administrators, players, were making those exact points. Mm. So there's some commonalities to the way the argument was being framed. But what all this meant was that the public was getting increasingly annoyed at the players. Some of the ex-players were, not surprisingly, coming out in force about what they were saying. So Rex Mossop came out and said, These guys, Gillies, Daly, Stewart and the rest, they seem to think they're indispensable. While the historical evidence of the game of rugby league is that no one's indispensable. These characters, so-called superstars, and they're not superstars in my view could walk away from the game tomorrow and it wouldn't matter. I hope they bloody well do. I hate the thought of such disloyalty being perpetrated on the rugby league public. I mean, until I read that in the research, I didn't know where he really stood on it. Like, he could easily come out and go, Super League's the best bloody idea ever. <laughs> you know, like, you know, you wouldn't know with him. It's going to be 100% either way. But Yeah. I've lost the quote, but there was someone saying, like, you know, oh, these players today... I'd like to see how they go with Paul Sate lining them up in the same. <laughs> <laughs> but it's never helpful having ex players chime in. Like, it's always just going to be, you know, I didn't earn as much money, so bugger yeah. them. Yeah. I just want to read this Bob McCarthy comment because there's a few things to unpack with this statement. They shouldn't have bagged the ARL. The ARL is sacrosanct. They've been making millions of people happy since 1908. The game has always been for the people. In the 50s, when South lost, People couldn't eat, they were that upset. <laughs> what a legend. <laughs> like the last part of that, I don't know how it's relevant to the argument, but I love the sentiment. <laughs> but like I put it to Bob McCarthy that it's not the ARL making millions of people happy. It's not Harold Matthews that's getting him through the doors. It's Bob McCarthy. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's funny that like there were so few old players that came out on the side of players. Yeah, odd. 
I feel that's something that's kind of changing now. I feel it's like something very typical in rugby league's past that, you know, players are prima donnas and, you know, these players today, they're spoiled, all the rest of it. I feel that's kind of going out. <laughs> well, in one of your uh, great history corners with the player from the 50s saying, like, sorry, the player from the 30s saying, these guys in the 50s have got it easy. Yeah, yeah that, that was Frank Birch <laughs> saying in 1952, players today were too pampered. <laughs> Yeah, like, but what do you think of that? Because I, I feel it's changing. I, I no, no, I, I agree with you. I think now it's more like uh, if you're one of the boys, you stick yeah. with the boys. Yeah. Before yeah. it was like once you retired, you become like a almost one of the administrators. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and I, I do like this may be oversimplifying it, but I, I do think you know the rise of full time professionals, which Super League you know basically enforced. I feel that that's made a difference. When you think about all the, you know, the older Super League players are now in their, you know, mid 50s, some of them. Yeah. Like, I think you can see as they become the old guard, like. Well, the old guys, you know, Noel Kelly was he a butcher or whatever, you know, training and then going, getting bashed up yeah. and then uh, cutting meat. He's like, well, I did it. So yeah. like, why in the hell should these guys get 300 grand? Yeah, yeah. But so at this point, this is when you're really starting to hear about some of the loopholes that the players were looking for. So a lot of talk about players going off to England, playing there. That would have been a disaster. You had Sherlock in the Rugby League Week saying, you can back it in that Bradley Clyde and Steve Walters will be blighty bound this year. So that was like a, you know, fait accompli that the Super League players would be in England. (laughs) If they weren't there, they'd be going to Rugby Union. If that had happened, that loophole to England, the deluge of homesickness would have been unstoppable. I actually got to give it to Dick McGruther, the boss of the ARU, when he was asked about the prospect of rugby league players coming over to Union. And, you know, he basically said, oh, they're welcome to come, but we're not going to pay him big bucks. We've already handed out all our contracts, so there's no money for them, but they're welcome to come. And then he came out with this. We're interested in guys who want to play rugby for the long term, not for the short term. For many years, we were told by rugby players that they had decided to play league, not for the money, but for the challenge. Now I wonder if there are any league players out there who want to play rugby, not for the money, but for the challenge. <laughs> there are not. <laughs> uh, and this is the point where Laurie Daly came out and said that, you know, he was interested in switching to AFL. Sickening. Well, he says that he wasn't serious about it. But interestingly, he had played Aussie Rules at a junior level in June A. And, you know, the Swans came out and said, well, he's got an open invitation any time he wants to come to training. I think he would have been a really big success in that. I mean, obviously, he would have had to go earlier. Yeah, like, just an athlete. Yeah, yeah. And uh, all the skills of that particular yeah. sport, thank God he didn't go. No, but uh, Swans legend Paul Kelly had no doubt that he'd make the move okay. So Kelly actually played against uh, Laurie Daly in rugby league for eight years. So um, Kelly was playing for Wagga Wagga, Daly for June E, uh, and he said that you know June E won it eight years in a row while he was playing against him. But, right. I didn't realise that Paul Kelly played rugby league for so long. but It's got its foot in every coat. Yeah, yeah, water. yeah. But, I mean, I don't want to go on about AFL too much. We've talked about before the impact that all this happening with rugby league had on AFL in Sydney. We've got a bit more talk about that down the track. But, you know, it was interesting Kevin Sheedy, who, of course, later went on to coach GWS, he came out and said it was a chance for us to, like, really get in there. You know, he said, there's definite disenchantment in New South Wales and Queensland. And look what it's done to help the cause of the Bears and Swans. Yeah. I mean, I was disgusted with the game, but I wasn't disgusted at the point of watching drivel. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) So this, to put it into context, this was all happening in the period between the judgment coming down and the orders coming down. But they were going to really determine what alternatives the Super League players had whether they were going to be able to just switch to rugby union, go to England, set up a new competition, all of that was going to come down to the orders. So in the midst of this, it was this weird holding pattern where they were trying to go on with the season. So the first step was the ARL postponing the season, which was due to start you know, the weekend after the court case. It ended up being pushed back a couple of weeks. Super League, of course, we've talked about were adamant that the competition was going to go ahead. Everything's on track. Lachlan Murdoch said, screw them, we'll be starting Friday. <laughs> Is that a rugby league player comment? <laughs> <laughs> Who's the judge? I, I think he'd been hanging out at Brisbane <laughs> training too much. <laughs> this kind of talk uh, gave Colin Love the opportunity to get a great line in. He said, I don't believe it. I can't believe they could be that silly. 
If the story is true, I hope the directors of the respective clubs bring their toothbrushes to court next week. <laughs> Uh, and one unnamed official said, if we're dead, we're dead. But the vibe at the moment is still very good. <laughs> so the vibe was very good until those orders came down, uh, which basically it was all over at that point. They weren't going to be able to play in any alternative competition. Super League couldn't convert to a rugby union competition or a 10-player you know, hybrid <laughs> game. It was basically the ARL or nothing. It was everything bar a straitjacket. Yeah. But you can understand why the ARL pushed so hard for these really prohibitive orders. So on the eve of the orders being handed down, a Super League player said, Neither the Federal Court, High Court or Pope will force me to play for the ARL. If we can't play for Super League, then we'll try to organise our own competition. Uh, Which gave Mark O'Brien the opportunity in court to say, of the prospect of players organising their own competition and that being legal, some of them can't even pack their bags without help. (laughs) So that obviously caused a lot of blowback from the players, a, a lot of offence. But I got to say, <laughs> got a point. <laughs> it's the equivalent of like when we played touch footy at school. If someone had a grievance with like a forward pass or something, someone would just go hands on heads. We're not playing, and then it's a hands on heads uh, situation. So at that point, it looked like it was all over. But a door was left slightly ajar. A few days later, when lawyers for Super League were granted an injunction to lift one of those orders, which was the no play, no pay edict. So under the original orders, players had to play or they wouldn't get their news limited money. Right. They managed to get that lifted, which meant that they could still get that money without playing. If I was news limited, I'd be like, you know what, let's just leave the order there. <laughs> <laughs> and so all this was happening with the rescheduled round one fast approaching. So as this deadline was approaching, there was a lot of speculation about what the lifting of this order meant, because technically it was argued that if they were being paid anyway from News Limited, they could start their own competition that didn't require payment. So it was basically just their own competition, a little kind of muck around amongst themselves. (laughs) And if, you know, 4 million people want to tune in on TV, well, you know, that's fine. The No Arcos Club. (laughs) And so in the midst of this, all this, the so-called group of 10 met in Sydney to talk about their next step. So this was one representative of each of the Super League clubs. So you had Matthew Ridge, Ricky Stewart, Andrew Weddinghausen, Chris Johns, Mark Sargent, who was there on behalf of the Mariners, Steve Stone for the Adelaide Rams, Simon Gillies, John Cartwright, Adrian Vowles, and Mick Potter. Why weren't the administrators there? Because this had nothing to do with the administrators. Oh. This was just the players. Right, okay. You know, uh, Morris Lindsay happened to be in town. <laughs> completely unconnected matter. But yeah, come down, Morris, you know. Uh, so Morris Lindsay was there. The players got together with international events company IMG uh, to help with the logistics of anything that they might you know, potentially set up. Uh, but at this stage, it was just about talking about what their options were. So <laughs> do you really want Matthew Ridge at that meeting? <laughs> Flicking people's ears and like... <laughs> but before it got to the stage of this rival competition, they had one last effort to bring peace with the ARL. Uh, so they met with the ARL with a series of 15 demands that would see them come back to the ARL fold and play. I'm just going to read you these 15 demands and I want you as the ARL representative (laughs) to yay or nay them, okay? And then we'll see how many you got compared to the ARL. All right, so one. So the proposal, the following 14 demands, uh, only apply to the 1996 season. Down with that? Yep. In the interest of the game of rugby league and its supporters, all Super League contracted players and coaches will, subject to any necessary approval, participate in a 1996 premiership competition under the auspices of the ARL, regardless of and without prejudice to the outcome of the current court proceedings. Okay. Players and coaches will participate under the terms and conditions of their existing Super League contracts and will not be required to sign new agreements. That sounds right. They'll pay. The competition is to be administered solely by the ARL and or the New South Wales Rugby League. Of course, yeah, we must run the game. Okay, here's where it might get interesting, but we'll see what you think. The competition will comprise 22 teams, including all current ARL-based teams and all Super League contracted teams, including the Hunter Mariners and Adelaide Rams. Do we really need the Hunter Mariners? (laughs) (laughs) 
It's yes or no question. No. <laughs> All right, six. All referees and other match officials contracted to Super League will be invited to officiate in the competition. We need the best refs. We certainly do. Very good point. I wish you had been running the ARL at the time. Okay, seven. The New Zealand Rugby League has indicated that it's prepared to participate in a test series between Australia and New Zealand. Only non-Super League contracted players will be considered for this series. Okay. All right, the next two I'm going to read as a package deal because it's either two or zero. So eight. Star League contracted players will not be available for the 1996 State of Origin series. And nine. A new three-way international competition will be staged involving teams from Queensland, New South Wales, and New Zealand. Only players contracted to Super League will be eligible for selection in this series. We'll have to respectfully decline that (laughs) generous offer. All right, 10. At the conclusion of the 1996 Premiership season, Super League contracted players and coaches will be free to participate in any test or international club matches not involving the ARL. Okay. Any players currently in dispute with clubs as a result of the Super League issue will be permitted to play for a club of their choice, including an ARL club for the 1996 season. Okay. Super League contracted players uh, in under-17s and under-19 teams will compete in the equivalent ARL sanctioned competitions. No point harming the juniors. No Super League contracted players will be forced to participate in any promotional activities related to the ARL competition. (laughs) That seems unreasonable. (laughs) 14. Super League contracted teams will wear their own Nike Super League jerseys, including the Super League numbering system. (laughs) That seems practical. (laughs) And 15, possibly my favourite one of all, in recognition of the past support given to the players and coaches by News Limited, we expect that Fox Cell will be allowed to broadcast certain games. (laughs) Well, we just sunk $250 million into it for that very reason, but, yeah, why not? <laughs> why not? Well, I love that the players, like, have been following this for a year and thought it was in Ken Arthurson's remit to grant pay TV rights. <laughs> like, you do realise, like, what, what this has all stemmed from for the past year. But you were actually more generous than the ARL. The ARL got to eight of those 15 demands, which I thought was pretty good on their part. But in Phil Gould's book, Ray Cheston, I think, says it well. It was a demand stunning in its audacity. Here was a proposed organisation listening to the sound of its own death rattle and making demands that would have been rejected if both sides were still waging an even battle. Yeah. <laughs> the best part for me, the pay to me one's uh, astonishing, but the best part's... We're going to wear our own competition's jerseys with different numbering systems. <laughs> Playing your competition, but wear yeah. our competition's jerseys. Just make it nice and confusing. But it's really interesting how much the players were willing to go into bat for the Rams and Mariners. Like the fact that that was one of the demands, you know, it was contingent on them being included in the is competition. That more, is that more the fact that they didn't want to put the boys out of a job, you know? I think that's definitely part of it. You know, and, and that's, yeah, that is looking out for the players I forgot about Mark Sargent, how much of a pariah he'd become after that. But it's just interesting. Like, I don't think that was anything the ARL were ever going to agree to. On the eve of the competition, just adding two more teams, including a second one in Newcastle. (laughs) But this statement by Arthurson on the prospect of an Adelaide team, I think it's really interesting. He said, this was an earlier interview in the Rugby League Week, earlier in March. He said, I'd rather see Melbourne for Adelaide. I think Melbourne has a better infrastructure. After all, Melbourne drew 87,000 people for an origin game, second biggest city in Australia, and recognised as one of the sporting capitals of the world. Anyone who wouldn't want Melbourne in a national competition would have rocks in their head. I haven't had any dealings with the South Australian government. Their dealings were with Super League. It could be they put their eggs in the wrong basket. To me, that's stunningly short-sighted. We saw how good Adelaide was going. And the thing is, like, again, I can't blame Arthurson for not wanting to include the Rams for 1996. But it's just so dismissive of the prospect. When South Australia... I've got to shout out a longtime friend of the show, Guy Hansen, our Adelaide correspondent, who yeah. recently sent me a great email outlining the case for an Adelaide team now, made some really compelling arguments. And a lot of those arguments that are true now were there in 1996, not least of which how easy the South Australian government made them to set up there. But not even that. It's like Melbourne's the second biggest city in Australia. Great. Um, but Adelaide's not exactly a cow yeah. paddock. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> you know, and saying, oh, look, I think the South Australian government put their eggs in the wrong basket. 
there was only one basket. <laughs> like th- there was no interest there from the ARL. Yeah, insane. But again, I'm I'm not knocking Arthurson for you know not bowing to including the Rams at this point. But the wash up of this meeting was one of the most infamous moments of the war. One we've talked about before. Laurie Daly's comment about being treated like dogs. So this was the result of the end of those talks. The Super League players were waiting to see what the ARL were going to say. Uh, And there was some agreement between the ARL and the players to not publicly detail what they were talking about until, you know, it's all been resolved. At this point, Arthurson has come out with a statement basically rejecting the players' proposal. This led to the players being up in arms about, you know, this handshake deal being broken and uh, and daily feeling that they were treated like dogs as a result. Slaves or dogs? <laughs> Which, again, it gave free ammunition to the ARL. Arthurson, you know, came out and said, the players who went on the last kangaroo tour, including Laurie Daly, were sent there in absolute luxury, stayed in the best hotels, all the rest of it. If that's being treated like a dog, I wish someone would treat me like a dog. Which, again, like, it's losing sight of the big picture. I mean, it's nice you sent them, like, business class or whatever. But it does nothing for the underlying, like, issues about, you know, what they're actually upset about. Hotel quality seems to be the barometer of rugby league treatment at all times, from the 30s onwards. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And as we've said before, Laurie Daly came out in the wake of a lot of fan anger, media anger, ex-player anger, a lot of anger directed at his comments about being treated like a dog. And he was just like, I was just saying they said they weren't going to say anything until they spoke to us and they went back on that. So to me, that was being treated like a dog. That It was a kick in the guts. I, I think it's an overreaction, but you can put it down to, it, it's a, a Mal really with the, the facts to Wally Lewis. It's not a general get stuffed, <laughs> just to get stuffed on this particular issue. <laughs> It's an odd phrase to use for that (laughs) grievance. But again, like, it's just laws, like, in the end. Like, I think it's just, like, a poorly worded statement that he hadn't really thought about much. Do you think Laws learnt he's probably speaking under Mal? (laughs) I think that's the only explanation (laughs) for it. But so that is where we leave this part of the chapter. So the players have issued some demands that were rejected by the ARL The season is about to start with no clear word on what players, if any, will be playing from Super League. So in part two, we will see exactly what happened uh, and some much more outlandish statements to come next week. (laughs) How is that possible? (laughs) But I'm so grateful that my memory's been blocked out on this because I'm feeling really like sick in the guts thinking about this start of this comp Mm. waiting for next week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seriously, it's like... It's awful. Yeah. I don't think we're spoiling anything to say that next week's episode involves a forfeit. I think a lot of people will remember that forfeit, but I don't remember any of like this kind of like... Just everything being up in the air. Yeah, yeah. God almighty. Um, But that's where we leave it for this week. So thanks for listening and we will be back with part two next week. Toodaloo.